tanks were born in Europe and their development was shaped primarily by the experience of wars in Europe. However, there were exceptions. For example, the Japanese designed their vehicles with an emphasis on transportability by ship. The Italians had their own peculiar assumptions about where their tanks would have to fight. But as it turned out, the Italian tanks had a unique battle record, fighting many of their battles far from Europe. The history of the Italian armored force began more than 100 years ago. Italy was a young nation, just 50 years old. Italy's dynamic development included a push to establish colonies in Africa. In 1911, Italy launched a war against the Ottoman Empire for the territory of Libya. In this war, the Italians became the first to use armored cars in battle. One of the first Italian armored cars, if not the first, was the Isotta Fraschini armored car. I think it was a car with 4mm armor plating. Successful use of armored cars sparked the development of new vehicle types. What started as a handicraft industry turned into mass production. Italy's war in Africa ended in 1912, but two years later, another war broke out near its borders. This wasn't just a colonial conflict. It was the First World War, a titanic clash between the major powers of Europe. Italy entered the war quite late after a long period of hesitation. Who to support? In 1914, the country was a member of the Triple Alliance, but its territorial claims were not against France or Great Britain, but against Italy's partner in the Triple Alliance, Austria-Hungary. A political debate ensued within Italy. Eventually, in 1915, Italy entered the war on the side of the Triple Entente. Along with the rest of her armed forces, Italy brought a decent-sized armoured force to the fray. The Italian army used two main types of armoured cars in both world wars, the Ansaldo Lancia IZ and the AB4041. Both vehicles had good characteristics, comparable in performance to the best foreign models. In particular, the AB43, which we see parked here, was also used by the German army from 1944 to 1945 and remained in service in the Italian army in the post-war years until the 1960s. The Railway Engineer Regiment used it to protect the railways. Italy fought its bitter enemy, Austria-Hungary. But its formidable armoured cars were not widely used during this war. The front line was in the mountains, where armoured cars could not be used effectively. And where there were no mountains, there were strong, layered defenses. Armoured cars lacked both terrain crossing capacity and firepower. By the summer of 1915, it became clear that Italy needed a tracked fighting vehicle. The Italians were moving in the same direction as other countries. Accordingly, the requirements developed by General Martini in 1915 were right on a par with the requirements of other countries that were starting to develop tanks. The first projects were much like those of the French, the British or the Germans. We might call it an armoured train or a land fortress. Two companies developed and produced armoured vehicles. Automotive company Fiat and engineering company Ansaldo. The history of Italian tank building would be connected with those companies until the end of World War II. The Ansaldo company, namely engineer Turinelli, began work on the first design in 1916. The vehicle was not adopted. The Fiat engineers succeeded in their attempt. They built the first mass-produced Italian tank, the Fiat 2000. This was a 40-ton vehicle with a very interesting design. Basically, it was the first tank with a rotating turret. And it had the world's first chassis, specifically created for a medium or heavy tank. Before that, everything was derived from agricultural tractors. The work on the vehicle started in October 1916. But just as the Fiat 2000 was being perfected, World War I ended. That's why only four vehicles were built. 
It took three years for the Italians to go from the start of development to the first mass-produced tank. The British, with their Mark I, did it in a year. So did the French with their Renault. But the Italian front had some specific complicating factors. Although the Italian army appreciated the characteristics of the Fiat 2000, they didn't put it on service, preferring light tanks. During World War I, the front line remained situated in mountainous terrain in northern Italy, and it was thought that heavy tanks wouldn't perform well in the mountains. As a result, the Italian army focused on the Renault FT-17. It was a light tank. They purchased five of them. It was tested in Italy and deemed acceptable, even perfect, to use in the mountains of Italy. Italy wasn't able to purchase any more Renault tanks. The French were giving everything to their own army. So the Italians decided to start production at home. The Fiat engineers made some creative choices. Instead of fully copying the French tank, they built a vehicle that was lighter and faster, with the same armor. The tank was designated the Fiat 3000. Unlike its French precursor, the Fiat 3000 had a transverse engine, allowing the hull length to be reduced. Also, it had one road wheel less than the Renault. The Fiat 3000 was the most successful derivative of the Renault FT. It was quite a good vehicle for the time. Its armament was good and became even better after modernization. It had an option for modernization that the French did not have. Its turret was more successful in terms of vision. As a result, a tank that was planned for the Italian army was eventually purchased by the armies of many other countries. The first prototype of the Fiat 3000 underwent tests in 1920, and the tank entered service a year later. The production run was only about 100 vehicles. However, the tank stayed in the Italian army for a long time. In 1930, it was upgraded. Some vehicles were equipped with 37mm guns, others received radio sets. The machine gun version had the designation L521, the Canon version was the L530. The Fiat 3000 had a very long history, starting in 1923, staying in service through to 1943, when several tanks were used against American forces landing in Sicily, the Allied invasion. The reason for the small production run and long service of the first Italian tanks was funding, or more precisely, the lack of it. World War I was not very successful for Italy. On the one hand, Italy was among the victors at the end. On the other hand, the pointless bloodshed had created discontent among the Italian people, and the country was locked in economic crisis. In 1922, Benito Mussolini rose to power. The dictator set out to create a great Italian empire. To do so, he needed a strong army, which was already unthinkable without tanks. However, there was no money for tanks. So the Italians turned to a different type of armored vehicles, tankettes. In 1929, they purchased a license for Card and Lloyd Mark VI from the British. Based on this design, the Ansaldo company developed the L3 light tank. In 1933, the Italian army started using a fast tank that was also later called a lightweight three-ton tank. It was a copy of another vehicle, the CV-29, a fast tank, model 29 of the British production. In fact, it wasn't a tank, but a tankette. It was a very light vehicle armed with a single machine gun. A second machine gun was added later. It had a crew of just two, and it was a meter and a half high, so it couldn't compete with tanks armed with cannons in any way. Nevertheless, the Italian army gave a lot of credit to this light vehicle and launched its mass production. The tankette first saw combat in 1935 and 1936 in Abyssinia, and was later used from 1936 through 1939 in the Spanish Civil War. This small maneuverable tank worked well in rough terrain. In addition, it could be used as an artillery tractor. Versatility was a very important feature for the vehicles of a relatively poor country. 
Almost half a dozen countries bought the L3, including Brazil, the vehicle saw combat in Spain and China. The Hungarian army even drove them into the Soviet Union. The L3 was a successful vehicle of its type. But it couldn't be the basis of a full-fledged armoured force. The Italian army needed real tanks, not tankettes. And there were more than just financial obstacles to that. The engineers were struggling to meet the contradictory requirements of the design specification. Italian military doctrine between the world wars envisioned a fight in the north of the Italian peninsula and the Alps. That's why the military wanted tanks that could operate on narrow roads and cross small bridges. They tried to solve this problem the same way they had with tankettes, learn from foreign experience. Italy purchased one Vickers Mark E tank from the British. But the best light tank of the time didn't inspire the Italian military. But then the Spanish Civil War caused the Italians to take another look at the Vickers Mark E concept. As did the Germans, the Italians first of all realized that the time of the machine gun tanks had passed, because the first combat use of German and Italian light tanks coincided with the use of the T-26. At extreme distances, the T-26s could do anything they wanted against the Italian and German tanks. As a result, the Italians started developing a turreted version of the L3 that later evolved into the L6 light tank. This vehicle was a high point of Italian light tank development. The design of the L6 was both outdated and forward-thinking at the same time. Its hull and turret were riveted, but the front was up to 30 mm thick. Quite good for a 7-ton vehicle, the tank was equipped with a torsion bar in combination with road wheels mounted on bogies. A turret was equipped with a 20 mm Breda autocannon. These were excellent characteristics for a pre-war tank. Unfortunately, the army got the L6 only in 1942, when the era of light tanks had passed. For several years, the Italian designers had put all their efforts into the development of heavier vehicles. After the Spanish Civil War, the Italians creatively mixed their military requirements with the design solutions of the British Vickers tank to build their own medium tank. The result they came up with was the Caro Armato M1139. This was an 11-ton vehicle with a diesel engine and a strange layout. Its hull was both riveted and bolted. By the time, it was already rather outdated. A 37mm gun was mounted in the hull. The turret was equipped with coaxial machine gun. It's not that the Italians were strange. Once again, they were looking at the experience of other countries. They've got a neighboring country, France. The French general, Estienne, developed the concept of the Char B tank. Basically, it was the M11, but had a bigger gun. Generally, they copied the conclusions of the French. During the war in Spain, small-caliber autocannon presented the greatest threat to tanks. 30 mm of front armor reliably protected the Caro Armato from such weapons. Maybe that's why the awkward layout of its armament didn't scare away the Italian military. They ordered 100 M1139 tanks. They were the only type of medium tanks Italy had in service at the time the country joined the Second World War. The military considered the M1139 a transition model to more advanced vehicles. As early as December 1937, the requirements for a tank with a 13-ton combat weight and a 47mm gun were specified. The fighting vehicle was designated Caro Amato M1340 and entered production in late 1940. At the time, the main theater of operations for the Italian army was Africa. The M1340 and its variants became the main tanks of this war. In the development of a more modern M13 tank, the main drawbacks of the M11 model were corrected. 
The new vehicle was equipped with a 4732 caliber gun. It had a diesel engine and wasn't very fast, but performed well during military operations in Libya in 1941. During the famous Battle of Bir el Gubi in November 1941, the Ariete Division entered a battle against the British 22nd Armoured Brigade. It managed to cause serious damage to this large enemy formation and stopped the British advance by destroying about 30 of their Crusader tanks. The main problem of the M1340 was that its hull and turret were riveted. However, all Italian tanks of World War II had this disadvantage. Historians had tried to find the reasons for this situation, and there were a lot of them, from political to production, from the quality of steel available to the location of the steelworks and the Fiat and Saldo monopoly. This solution was highly unsuccessful. It was connected with an idea the designers thought was practical. The engineers had the idea that if one of the plates took a hit, it could be replaced, and the tank could return to the battle. But this simply didn't work in practice. Despite its flaws, the M1340 became the most produced Italian tank. 710 vehicles were built. Later, another 695 of an improved version. The Caro Armato M1441 were built. In 1940 and 1941, the Italian tanks fought the British cruiser tanks on almost equal ground. If we're talking about armoured forces, there was almost parity between them. To be honest, the British tanks of the early war period weren't better than the Italian ones, to put it mildly, including their reliability. For example, the failure rate of the cruiser Mark II was more than 50%. If it wasn't for the Matilda, who knows what might have happened. The Matilda tanks behaved even more cheekily than the Tigers in 1943. The Italians didn't have anything to stop these tanks. All they could hope to do is to knock off a track or jam turrets. Nothing more. The Italians knew that the M1340 and M1441 were outdated and tried to replace them. An upgraded version of the tank was prepared, the M1542. Its front armor was increased to 45 mm. A more powerful engine was installed. Unlike the other tanks of the M series, it had a gasoline engine. The gun caliber remained the same, 47 mm, but the barrel length was increased. The muzzle velocity increased by 30%. Its shell now could penetrate 40 mm of armor at a range of 500 meters. It became the last in the series of M1340 modifications and the best Italian medium tank of World War II. 194 vehicles of this model were produced by September the 8th, 1943. When the M1542 was developed, it was already at least a year overdue. Since the fall of 1942, the British Army had been using the M4 medium tanks, or the Shermans as the British called them. They outmatched the Italian tanks in every way. The M1542 gun could penetrate them only at point-blank range. Despite this inferiority, Italian tankers faced the enemy in open terrain, suffering serious losses, especially in the Battle of El Alamein. Counting only military personnel engaged in combat, the Italian armoured forces suffered heavier casualties than any other branch of their army. It's worth noting that almost all, or even all, Italian tank cases, who earned the top honour, the Medal of Military Valour, had similar exploits. That is, they fought in the M1340 or M1441, and in almost every case, they went into an assault with almost no chance of survival. Italian engineers tried to develop a machine suited for the fighting in North Africa. The result was the Sahariano, an 18-ton vehicle with torsion suspension, low silhouette and high maneuverability. While working on it, the Italians copied a range of elements from the T-34. Even its tracks are essentially identical to those of the T-34. And that's not surprising, because the Germans loaned one of their trophy T-34s to the Italians for testing. 
A development prototype was ready in the spring of 1942, but its characteristics were not impressive enough to justify adoption. Two years later, the Sahariano was dismantled. The Italian tanks couldn't compete with the Allied machines and couldn't change the course of the war. In Libya, Italian troops waved the white flag at Cap Bon on May the 13th, 1943. Two months later, Allied forces landed in Sicily. The invasion of Italy began. In late July, Benito Mussolini was overthrown. The new government signed an armistice with the United States and Great Britain on September the 3rd. After that, the Germans occupied Italy, disarmed its army, and created the Italian Social Republic. The factories where the Italians were about to start producing a new heavy tank passed to the Germans. The new tank never went into service with the Italian army. Eventually, about a hundred tanks that were ready at the factory were used by the Germans, who occupied the territory of Italy and made local manufacturers work for the Worm Act. Roughly speaking, they were comparable to the Panzer Kampfwagen IV. The Italians had started developing a heavy tank back in December 1938. First, they designed a tank, taking the German Neubau-Fahrzeug as an example. The vehicle had several turrets. However, they quickly gave up on this scheme. Development shifted to the Caro P. Much like the Sahariano, it was influenced by the Soviet T-34. You can see that influence in the shape of the hull and turret. The final P-40 variant, known as the P-2640, had a combat weight of 26 tons. The armor can be called adequate, and its armament relatively powerful, but only compared to medium tanks of that time. Its hull was still riveted. The lack of a powerful engine was the factor that limited the development of Italian armored vehicles most of all. Even the P-26, a well-known heavy tank, never went into service with the Italian army. Its development was badly delayed because of the lack of a powerful engine. The one that was available, a petrol engine, was not powerful enough for a tank of that weight. The Germans suffered from the same issue. The Italians planned to continue developing heavy tanks. Based on the P-40, they designed a more advanced tank, the P-43, with higher weight and thicker armor. Development got as far as the mock-up stage. An even more interesting project, the P-43 BIS, reached the same stage. This project was a true heavy tank. It had a combat weight of 34 tons and a 90mm gun, a shortened version of an anti-aircraft gun. Another P-43 BIS project had a Sahariano-type running gear and a more powerful gun. After World War II, a number of restrictions were imposed on Italy. Among other things, development of military machinery was limited. American and British vehicles became the core of the Italian armored forces. In the late 1950s, Italy resumed tank development. By the early 60s, the country joined the standard Panzer program, which resulted in a significant tank, the Leopard 1. The C1 Arietti became the greatest success of the Italian tank building industry in the post-war period. The tank was developed in cooperation with German companies and was based on the Leopard 2. 200 tanks of this type were produced. Today, the C1 Arietti is the backbone of the Italian armored forces. The Italians make big money off vehicle modernization and also wheeled vehicles. Their wheeled vehicles are among the most advanced. The history of the Italian tank building was short. Currently, there's little impetus for building a new tank in Italy. If one is created in the near future, it will probably be a multinational project.